start up perfectly on time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't so worry. yeah, next speaker is uh, Tuan Fan. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for the organization. So today I'm going to uh, uh, explain about my recent work with Professor Kunik Kanenko on the, um, some kind of uh, theory for the genotype phenotype coevolutions. Uh, we call it double replica, but maybe at the end of the talk, you will have a better name and suggest it to me, maybe. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, my talk consists of three parts. The first part is just uh, uh, to introduce you with the broad context of the questions, and then we will move to a more technical part, and then the uh, final one will be about the biological relevance of the model and the method. So the motivation is following. I think you have uh, seen a lot uh, um, during the last two lectures by Kuni that uh, the main questions of interest is uh, in biological system, you have two components. So the phenotype and the genotype. And uh, they can both influence each other. So you have one arrow going from the genotype to phenotype, representing the influence of genotype on phenotype, but then you also have the feedback effect from phenotype to genotype. So this forms a feedback loop between these two entities. And uh, we also know from uh, more traditional theory established in biology that the genotypes can uh, undergo some mutations, and uh, the selections uh, based on fitness actually act on phenotype. And, um, under the influence of uh, this uh, feedback loop and under the uh, like effect of mutation and selections, uh, you may ask a question about the robustness of the system uh, as uh, an emergent behavior. So an emergent property is coming out from this system of uh, uh, many degree of freedom interacting with each other. So this is the main question here. Try to show that robustness is some emergent property in the, how to say, more familiar to you, like the uh, condensed matter physics uh, style of uh, emergent behavior. Um, so this is the main question, but uh, how we need to approach this. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, remind ourselves that the system are located in some environment. So the seated area here, just to represent that everything happened under some given environmental conditions. and. Um, the next thing, uh, also a bit of a, uh, a reminder, is that in the traditional field of population uh, genetics, you have the one-to-one -one mapping from the genotype to the fitness. So fitness here is defined as a function on the space of genotypes. But actually, one we think about this feedback loop, so the feedback loop between two components, phenotype and genotype, we think that this traditional point of view does not work in general because this means that you're missing the intermediate component of, of the phenotype. So uh, in our opinions, uh, we think that it may be better to consider this kind of sandwich structure. So the sandwich structure is that you go from genotype to phenotype and then to fitness. And then this will uh, capture the interrelationship between phenotype and genotype here through the genotype-phenotype mapping. So um, the, the aim of my talk is just to first formulate this kind of sandwich structure and then so how this kind of sandwich structure uh, can be used, can be applied in that context to answer the question of the robustness of the biological system. Yeah? Can, can I ask a question yeah? that perhaps I should ask at the end? Uh, so. Here, uh, I mean, clearly, if uh, the mapping between genotype and fitness is deterministic, uh, we are in yeah. population genetics realm and there is no yeah. problem. Now, the fact that there is a stochasticity, yeah. it's in both of the two yeah. arrows. We will show that okay. we take into account the stochasticity in both of these arrows. So from genotype okay. to phenotype, one stochasticity, and from phenotype okay. to fitness, another stochasticity. But then so I'll ask the question at the end. Yeah. OK. Is, is there any other questions? Uh, if not, then I can move on. Um, so uh, uh, first we talk, so we have two arrows here, right? Genotype to phenotype and phenotype to fitness. Uh, first, let's take a look at the uh, map being from phenotype to fitness. So 
fitness. Uh, so one one uh, interesting observation, and I think uh, Kuni had uh, emphasized in his last two lecture is that quite typical in many biological systems, such as a protein, you have two parts. One is a functional part, uh, and the other is a remaining non-functional one. And he calls the functional part the target part. For example, the binding site of the protein, and the non-target one, the non-functional one, is some residual. So inactive site, for instance. And here, just as a cartoon, this guy of Pac-Man shape. So with the mouth of the Pac-Man, is a functional, the target part, and on the remaining uh, representing the non-target one. And the, so with this kind of structure, very naturally to ask the, the following question that how does this uh, vision, so the composition of the system into two components will affect its robustness. And uh, as a matter of fact, so in this uh, recent paper, uh, they published a few data set about the protein and Actually, it uh, had been shown that the uh, size, the relative size of the functional part is around 10 to 20 percent. So it's a kind of relatively, uh, uh, how to say, smaller than the remaining one. And uh, in, the, in the next few slides, we also focus on this kind of small fraction of the uh, functional part as a demonstration of the main the approach and the theory. Um, so now we go back uh, next to the maybe most, uh, how to say, complicated uh, 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 mappings. So the, the one from genotype to phenotype. So from the fitness of an individual carrying the phenotype P, so P is just a mapping from the space of phenotype P here to, to R plus, right? Uh, if there, is, there are multiple phenotype P's corresponding to the same given uh, genotype G's, then the fitness can be defined as an expectation value of this fitness over the distribution of the phenotype. The uh, uh, biological literature, for instance, you can look at this review for more detail, but what you can take uh, um, as a take home message at the end from this kind of uh, uh, structure is that you will have the fitness for a given uh, phenotype, but you have a distribution of the phenotype, and that the distribution is conditional on the phenotype genotype mapping here. So this is the genotype phenotype mapping that plays a very important role in um, uh, like connecting different uh, biological systems at different scales. So you have the scale of the genotype, so it's kind of a uh, micro scale and then you have the scale of the phenotype which is the observable biological chart of the organism, right? So this mapping, uh, this phenotype genotype mapping actually connects the things that happen at two different scales. And then the fitness, the more traditional fitness like the, uh, the right fitness landscape of the genotypes it actually can be understood as a the mean value with respect to the distribution of the phenotype here. So according to this uh, genotype phenotype mapping argument, uh, and so this, this uh, function here, so this uh, genotype phenotype mapping here, right, it's very general. Actually, if you look at many review in biological literature, everyone almost have one realization of that mapping. So it's not uniquely defined, it can have a, uh, uh, multiple form, it can be stochastic function, it can be deterministic, it can be whatever you come up with. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, aim of my talk today is to talk about one specification of that function. So uh, like uh, 15 years ago, Cooney have introduced a model, a simple statistical physics style model, which gives you one specification of this genotype phenotype mapping. To just to straight, uh, to stretch it, we are not aiming to capture the most general function uh, RGP here. We will only show one specification of that and hope that this, uh, even this uh, toy uh, model with uh, some simplification, but um, it uh, can give you some uh, uh, meaningful insight. Yeah? Um, so let I call that model the SHK model. So because it's introduced by Cooney and 
he's a collaborator uh, uh, in this uh, PAL 2009. And uh, so all the components here are represented by something that you are more or less familiar in physics. So you have the spin. So you have a vector of spin, right? Because you, uh, you have a system with many spin. So each component, each spin, uh, is, uh, each spin correspond to one component of a spin vector. So the, <coughs> the full spin vector represents the phenotype. And all the spin configuration, all the possible spin configuration represents the phenotype space. And then you have the gene. It's quite interesting that the, so I asked Guni why he come up with that idea. Is that maybe because the, the spin are interacting, so they are determined by the rule given uh, as uh, the uh, gene here, the couplings between the two spin dictate how the spin need to behave. So this is why, like as a matter of metaphor, the, the genes can be encoded, represented by this coupling between two spin. So this is the phenotype, and this is geno uh, genotype, here, here is the phenotype. And then, because the system are embedded into environment, then you need a few more parameters which represent. Now we come to Jacopo question. We have two sorts of stochasticity. One is the noise to the dynamic of the phenotype, which is the TS here. And then you have another kind of noise, but uh, you can call it also not noise, but inverse of the selection pressure which acting on the dynamic of the genes. And then you have the quite standard external condition representing by this external field HI here. So these are all the basic component of the model. But uh, of course, as is, uh, we want to uh, uh, use this sandwich structure, we need to define two functions. So the first one is the one that's more or less clear from the previous slide that you have the phenotype to fitness. So because you have the division of the spin into two groups, so the target and the non-target, then based on the configuration of the target spin, you can define the fitness. So the fitness is a mapping from the spin configuration, the phenotype here, to the fitness. This is one function you need. And another function you need is how the dynamic of the spin influenced by uh, the matrix of the couplings, the JIJ here. So the phenotype genotype mapping in the context of this model is basically the Hamiltonian, or some kind of spin glass Hamiltonian. So go back to one slide, yeah? In that model, they, in that general structure, they left it open how you specify this mapping and the specification could we have introduced it to use this Hamiltonian to specify the mapping, because the assumption is that the mapping is also stochastic mapping. So with that Hamiltonian, you can run Monte Carlo simulation. You can introduce the, the TS here, so the noise to the phenotype. Yeah? yeah I have a question. I don't understand what is the environment here. The environment here is just some kind of bias, right? If you have, you think about this as a, a, a bit string sequence, right? Plus one or minus one or on and off for the gene. So the, the external field just bias. Some gene need to be on, some gene need to be off. So it enters in the Hamiltonian. Yeah, it, it will be the external field enter to the Hamiltonian. But it doesn't enter in the, in the fitness. It, it doesn't enter it in the, the... No, no, it does not affect that fitness. Uh, it does not enter the fitness explicitly, but since it affects yeah, yeah. the spin, yeah. it implicitly. Okay. So everything is taken into account into two different ways, sometimes explicitly and sometimes in, uh, implicitly, because everything is like wrapped up inside that function. And as soon as you see the expression for that uh, fitness function, it will be clear for you. Yeah? Um, is there any other question? So, so just to, to just summarize again the, the, the dictionary of the SHK model, right? You have two different types of degree of freedom, two different kind of dynamic overrival. So the couplings, this, this is very important to stress here because uh, uh, it's in the different from the more spin the last time model. Here the couplings are also dynamic overrival. So it's involved on different time scale, assumed to be slower than the time scale of the phenotype. 
But um, then, yes, you have the Hamiltonian to give the rule of the dynamic for the phenotype, and then you have a fitness function and all these sort of parameters. So this is a dictionary of, of the SHK model. Now we come to the uh, more detail of the model. So first, because uh, you have uh, enjoyed the spring college for the last three weeks, you may be quite familiar with two well-established concepts, one in physics and one in biology, right? On the left-hand side, you have the free energy landscape defined as a function of the spin configurations under a given set of the couplings. So if you fix the couplings, you have some kind of free energy landscape structure. And then you also know that you have this kind of fitted landscape, which basically define in the space of the genotype. And they are uncoupled in the sense that they emerge in different fields. You don't put them into any connection. And the SHK model, I think this is the most uh, innovative feature of the SHK model. It, uh, uh, they have tried to combine and to connect these two pictures into a single model. So they integrate the two landscapes into a couple manner. So now you will have the uh, dynamic on the free energy landscape affects the things that happen on the fitness landscape, and then the fitness landscape in turn will also deform the free energy landscape because under the selection, the genotype will change, and whenever the genotype change, the phenotype uh, on this free energy landscape also be deformed. So this is the, the most important structure that you need to at least uh, recognize that we are, what we are talking is different from physics or biology because it's a combination of the two in an integrated manner. And now we, we are, so one other thing just to emphasize again, maybe, so this dynamic of the spin, right, we call the fast evolution. And here the dynamic of the genes, we call the slow evolution. And for the spin, there are two set of spin, target and non-target. And, um, now, uh, the, the dynamic of the spin are quite standard. This, uh, many of you have seen it, maybe. Uh, this is just a global update dynamic of the spin so that you try to minimize the uh, energies over time. Uh, and uh, at each uh, uh, step, you just uh, randomly pick one spin and then flip it. So you do that uh, evolutions, Monte Carlo simulation, until the spin configuration reach to equilibrium. and yeah? yeah? Yeah, please, go ahead. So is the JIJ symmetric? JIJ is symmetric here. Okay. Yes, this is, so the, it needs, before any kind of evolution, the JIJ is draw from the random distribution, like Gaussian distribution, for instance. It uh, lies the same line in the SK model, so it's a fully connected spin glass model, without the evolution of the couplings. This is the, the standard SK model. And now um, it is coupled to the slow evolution. So in the slow evolution, now I'm really happy to show you for the first time this explicit expression of the fitness function. So the fitness function is a thermal average of the magnetization of the absolute value because we want to take into account the uh, uh, Z2, the mirror symmetry between the up and down uh, configuration, right? So we take the absolute value here. But what we want to say is that in order for the system to be functional, the spin need to be quite cooperative. So cooperative in that context means they all line up, they all line to maximize this sum, right? And then to take the thermal average uh, with respect to the Boltzmann distribution uh, given by this exponential of this the minus beta h here, right? And then you get this fitness as a, the thermal average here. And once you get that fitness, you will update the couplings. But now, instead of the normally you choose the change in the uh, energies to update the spin, you will uh, choose the change in the fitness to update the coupling. So this is, um, you can think that for the, just to make it in the, as a, an analogy, but maybe not the perfect analogies. So instead of the energy, now, the role of the energies is a fitness, and this will be the fitness that determine how the JIJ should involve. Yeah? 
Sorry, when you say fast is low, fast is low, fast is low, yeah. you mean... Uh, okay, so I need to explain that first, right? So now we, we go to the realization of the dynamic. So you fast, uh, you, you first, sorry, you first implement the fast evolution of the spin. When it reaches to equilibrium, you go to the slow dynamic. And then once the slow dynamic also supposed to reach equilibrium, you go back to the fast dynamic of the spin because now you have a new coupling constant matrix, right? And then once it's over, you go back to the slow, you iterate that consecutively until the entire system relax to the equilibrium. So this is a, the picture. I, I'm sorry, maybe this is not the best way to describe that dynamic. But it's really like, uh, so you, you do the spin dynamic, then you do the coupling dynamic, and then you go, go back to spin, and then to couplings, so on and so forth, until the entire system reaches to equilibrium. Yeah? The, the field is inside the tau, or it's the, what variable is it? Sorry? This the, is the index of the spin in the target set. Yeah, in, and like, because at the beginning you was uh, writing a, a field HI. Like it's just present in the This is the, the external target. field. It can be added here. It can be oh, added so here. So you, you don't field. have, you just have in the Hamiltonian the Yeah, so the in field. some version, Cooney consider mm -hmm. also the external field. But in the baseline model, there's no external field. So now I just don't talk about external field because I want to make things simple first, no? Okay, and also, yeah. like, uh, when you uh, perform the dynamics, you just first do the fast, then the slow. Uh, how do you know that uh, it equilibrates to the right system if you... Oh, no. yeah, yeah, so when you do the Monte Carlo simulation, what you need to measure is the correlation time. Once you know that the, uh, the correlation time, you can know how much, how many Monte Carlo steps you need to run the system to at least get some to some kind of, some sort of equilibrium. No, but I mean, if you do it, uh, if you do the dynamic, uh, both the fast and the slow yeah. at the same time, maybe you reach a different equilibrium system. Yeah, it could be true, but one point is, uh, so it's this, uh, uh, this is a simplification description of the model. Actually, in order to speed up uh, the dynamic to converge to the, uh, Cooler system equilibrium here. Uh, Cooney and his collaborator use a technique called parallel tempering. So maybe you heard about that. So parallel tempering is just a trick to uh, swap the temperature between different systems in order to get the entire system relaxed to the equilibrium. So I'm not so sure. I agree with you. Maybe it had not reached to the uh, total equilibrium state, but let's take it as an, um, something granted because actually they. They check it quite carefully. Normally, because they simulate the system of 15 spin only. So with 15 spin, you can run million Monte Carlo steps. So with million Monte Carlo steps, I think you can trust your simulation that it reached to equilibrium. Yeah? Uh, is there any other question? OK. Uh, let me continue. Mm. So just to, again, just to summarize structure, because uh, I think it uh, needs to be uh, go over and over to this structure, otherwise it's not clear, right? So you have a, a, a system of spin, you divide them into target and non-target. So target is a, a left-hand side here, and non-target is the right-hand side. And then you have the green uh, connection here, which represents the uh, interaction between uh, two different groups of spin, right? This is what we call JTO. So JTO is a coupling between target and non-target spin. And inside each group, you have, for instance, JTT, which is an interaction among the target spin, and the JOO, which are the interaction among the non-target of spin. And finally, the fitness is just a way to distinguish between the target and non-target spin because it's only act as a function that is uh, depend, uh, de dependent on the uh, configuration of the target spin. So this is the basic structure of the model. I think it's very really important to, to, to emphasize this point before we move to the analysis and some result of the model. Um, okay, so now, well, once you have seen that picture, we can move uh, to the next part. Um, 
So first, what has been done in the simulation? What has been uh, uh, observed in Cooney uh, paper? So uh, he first considered two uh, quantity, right? Which is uh, in the physics, so we call it all the parameter, right? Some uh, measurable that uh, is are of the great importance to learn about the system behavior, right? So on the left hand side is the fitness. You have the fitness uh, side here, uh, plot with respect to the TJ and TS, right? So the TJ is uh, uh, inverse of the selection pressure for the genotype, and TS is a standard uh, uh, spin temperature, the thermal noise. And uh, that things have the uh, high value, of course, at the low value of the TS, and expected right? at low temperature you uh, should have high you should have higher fitness because there is smaller uh, thermal fluctuation um, and uh, but in terms of the free uh, in terms of the energy the thing that he observed is quite peculiar in my opinion because actually the regions in the phase diagram in which you have minimal energies is not at the lowest uh, temperature TS uh, some of you may know this uh, condo kind of effect in the condensed matter, like the energy is not at the global minimum, at the uh, zero temperature, but at some intermediate value of the temperature. It's quite peculiar. It's uh, something interesting. And when he plot this as a 3D plot here, right, you see this uh, deep uh, minima is here. So corresponding to TS around 1.2, uh, one. Yeah. Does this depends on the fact that uh, um, there is not enough time to equilibrate? No, I th don't think so because I, I, as I mentioned to answer some of the questions from the audience, the system he simulate here. I think I where is the number? Okay, I did not uh, put it here. But he have only 15 spin, and he have five target. No, three target. So 20% of the spin are target, and they run the motor couple simulation for one million time step. And for each of these, uh, like switch from slow to fast, they also use some enhancement, which is parallel tempering. So parallel tempering is a speeding up technique for equilibrate the spin last system. And one of the co-author is actually the inventor of this parallel tempering. So I have no doubt in terms of they really equilibrate the system. So, and um, okay, now we can go to the next uh, slide, uh, next plot, sorry. So apart from the energy, the fitness, uh, Kuni also measures this, what he called gene-gene correlation. So the gene-gene correlation is a product of the two couplings which have the carbon uh, not I here. So you can call them adjacent connection in the sense that they share the same not I, but they are having different not uh, K and K price. So this is a gene gene uh, correlation that he observed in the simulation that this correlation also become uh, quite positive and close to one in this uh, intermediate value of the, the TS. But apart from that, uh, a neighborhood is almost zero. So it's, this uh, quantity is quite uh, correlated to the structure in what you observe in the energy. So when that correlation is maximal, it's also kind of uh, at the global uh, minimum of the energy function. Yeah. So this is what has been observed in the simulation with 15 speed and three of them are target. And by uh, combining all these three quantity, three observable, he draws this phase diagram structure of the model. So you can have this, what he called local matrix state. Why the local but not global? Because the local matrix state here just ensure that there is no frustration among the target spin. But among the non-target spin, there are still uh, a lot of frustration. So this is just a local in that sense. Uh, matrix state only for the uh, target spin. And then you have this uh, other phase spin, the last phase and the para phase. And so with his collaborator, he also tried to apply some uh, uh, standard quench limit approach in spin glass to 
have some picture of the phase diagram. It's a representative, but uh, it also show up some discrepancy with respect to what uh, obtained in the simulation. So for instance, you see that here, the local matrix state only emerge for non-zero temperature, but here it's uh, already emerged at zero temperature, for instance. And, and another thing is that um, the quench limit assume that the JIJs are fixed they are quenched, they don't involve over time, but the model setting actually involves the JIJ because of the mutation. So this works only as a kind of approximation, then uh, there are a lot of things that need to be uh, built upon and improved. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so the multi steps is uh, um, by, by definition, it's equivalent to the ferromagnetic state. So the ferromagnetic state, you have all the spin align, right? You have all the spin align, and there is, uh, there is no frustration among the spin. And the multi state can happen if you have, uh, for instance, two up and one down here. But in the, uh, in the triangle, the spin that is up here is up here, are linked by a positive couplings, and here they are linked by the negative coupling. So the multi state, is the one, by definition, can be obtained from the ferromagnetic state by a gauge transformation. So if you do some gauge transformation, um, you can transform the matrix state to the ferromagnetic state. So they are related by the gauge symmetry. Okay, other question? No question, okay. So this is the uh, description of the model and some of the uh, previous results obtained by Cooney and his collaborator. Um, and just to, because the, some of you may not know this kind of spin glass, uh, uh, quench approach. So this is what I just try to make sure that everyone on the, on the same page. So I will spend just two minutes to explain that. So in this uh, kind of uh, very well-established field research, Pioneering by uh, Giorgio Parisi and Finn Anderson, they consider a uh, spin model with this uh, kind of uh, random couplings. And then this means that the coupling constant uh, are specified by some distribution, right? And then the, what people can learn about this system is basically uh, um, they take this uh, the observation of the existence of some kind of cell overaging behavior. So cell overaging, just to say that, uh, for any uh, random instance of the system of coupling, um, the property of the system are much not different from the average uh, system, the one that you obtain by taking the uh, average of the free energy with respect to the distribution of the coupling here. So, and then the famous uh, well-known replica chick to analyze the free energy of this uh, system. And uh, so this is just to explain to you uh, how uh, these uh, people have been working on this quench limit approach for this, uh, to, to try to get some analytical argument for this simulation. So I will not keep uh, more detail on that, but uh, okay, maybe it's also something I can skip. But now I will focus on the aim of uh, a new approach. Uh, why we need a new approach, this is the first question, right? Because maybe it's the quench approach, it already very uh, powerful, uh, it's uh, like, were created by many great scientists better than um, me, like thousands of times. So maybe we don't need the quench uh, extension approach. But uh, one thing, uh, we want to emphasize that the coupling constantly are involving. So it's a very contradictory to the quench approach when you assume that the JIJ are fixed. So at least this is one motivation. You need to have something that capture uh, the dynamic of the JIJ. And then the second thing that is important is, as you see in the description of the model, uh, as a, like many of you ask, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. So you have some kind of really hybrid uh, description of the model. You don't have a single dynamic which can describe both the evolution of S and J in a single framework. So the question is, can we formulate a combined dynamic. If we can formulate such a combined dynamic, 
We don't need to do like fast slow, fast slow, fast slow anymore. We have only one single equation. Describe both of them. So this is the aim. And um, in that uh, combined dynamic, the JIJ will become explicitly a degree of freedom. And the uh, second thing is that uh, as the last aim is um, hopefully with this new kind of idea and argument, we can extend uh, uh, to some non-equilibrium system. So this is the aim of well, why do we need a new approach? So yeah, this is for the sake of motivation. Uh, now we go to the detail. I will try to be minimalistic here because uh, there are many uh, um, uh, paper, many previous work that have uh, inspired me to come up with this uh, uh, approach. So first of all, there is uh, one important paper written by uh, Sherrington Coolen uh, in 1994 here. So they introduce this kind of Langevin dynamic for the couplings in their model, in their original paper, is this work for neural network. So basically for neural network, this is the dynamic of JIJ is what they call learning dynamic. And then the dynamic of the JIJs uh, have the, apart from the noise term here, this is actually the derivative term coming from some potential. And you can call that effective potential. So this is the kind of a, a framework to describe the evolution of the JIJ within the context of the neural network. We are not doing neural network here, but I got uh, inspiration by this approach. Uh, but um, in this uh, uh, effective potential, uh, Kulin and his group only consider two terms. So V here is a sum of two terms. The first term is V0. So V0 is just basically a decay term. You need something that makes a thing about it. If you don't have the decay term, everything grows infinitely. Um, and then there is some uh, term, another term, which represents the effect of the spin on the JIJ. And for many of you, it may be quite familiar. It represents, to some extent, the Hepian learning rule. So the, the state of the JIJ needs to be adapted to the state of the two spin at the two end of the link. So basically, which is two components, uh, you have the first description for learning dynamic in neural network context. But in our model, it's very important to say that um, we have two other components that uh, um, the old paper had not considered. First is fitness. So there is no fitness in this neural network model. And secondly, there is no decomposition to target and non-target spin. So the model here, that we consider first time here, have only two terms. No fitness, no decomposition. This, this is very important. So why we need to extend and generalize this approach? Because otherwise, this model will only work for neural network, but not for the evolution, genotype, phenotype question that we are interested in. <coughs> By the way, just to, to, to make the uh, connection to some recent like kind of empirical paper. So in this uh, PNAS, the last year paper, this group of uh, authors uh, consider something they call frustration. Of course, uh, their definition of frustration is not exactly frustration in spin glass physics, but it's rather be called frustrated edges. So the fraction of frustrated edges here is what they call frustration. But anyway, um, this quantity, they observe that are quite minimal in many empirical data sets. So they consider different uh, biological re gene regulatory network. And the observation they found is that what common is that the fraction of this frustrated edge is quite minimal, which means that you, if you take a connection from left and right here, you see that, uh, which means the, the couplings, JIJ, and the state of the two spin SIJ should give a positive product. So the meaning of this term is quite similar. It's some kind of adaptation of the link to the state of the two end of the links. So just one example, a far away context, but just somehow explain some empirical evidence, because otherwise you will just look at this equation. OK, some people introduce this uh, form. That may work only for neural network, but actually it's quite a reasonable form of interaction between two speeds that affect the dynamic of the link between them, as they are also observed in other contexts. 
So, okay, so this is what has been done and this is what can be done, like back to 1994, uh, right? Now, if we have the fitness uh, and the decomposition, what should we change? First, we need to consider a new term, which will represent the fitness. So, as you may remember, the fitness is a local marketization of the target spin. So, this is the sum here over the target spin, right? And then, uh, it uh, can be represented in this form, so that it can contribute to the derivative of effective potential here in the Langevin equation. And uh, apart from the fitness, um, if you take a, into, uh, a look back at the cartoon of the model, right? You have one group of spin target, and you have another group of spin non-target. If there is no uh, interaction, like intergroup interaction, then the uh, frustration can only happen within each of the group. So you can have the frustration inside this group of spin. You can have frustration among the other group of spin. But there is no frustration between, for instance, like the two non-target spin and one target spin here. So when you consider the structure of the model, so the decomposition into two groups of spin, you will have this kind of triangle. So this is a kind of a triangle that connects two different groups of spin. And then that triangle can be frustrated. And then it introduces some frustration into the dynamic of the pick of the group of spin. So just to clarify here, it's why it's important, because without this intergroup interaction, so without the green link here, you don't need this term, so the last term, what we call frustration here. But in the presence of this green link, you need to take into account this kind of gene-gene uh, -gin interaction. Yeah. So basically, if you multiply this f with the jij, you will have jij, j I K and J K I. So it's actually as a product of the of the three uh, terms. So and with this frustration effect, with that effect, these are the two new ingredients in our framework. So in uh, uh, different from the neural network context, we need to have two more terms. One is the fitness and one is the frustration. And the frustration is induced say again by the green links. Yeah? Um, so with all these four terms, now I just summarize it because uh, maybe it's not clear. So basically, this is a V, and V is the sum of the four terms. And all of these terms I look here uh, explicitly how they look like. And uh, then you can just do the very standard uh, statistical physics uh, approach. Um, you know that this Langevin dynamic will relax to this Bonneman distribution when the time go to infinite, and then you can calculate the partition function. And now the structure of that partition function is something that can be uh, interesting to remark. So apart from the more or less standard to you from the uh, spin glass literature, so you have the term which represents the spin replica, you will have another term which represents this JTO, so the green link in the previous slide. So the green link because uh, it also have the plus and minus one value here, which will occur with some rescaling. So you can reinterpret this term as a, some kind of two indexes. The upper index is a replica index of that uh, variable. So this means that apart from the more uh, conventional spin replica, you will have some kind of, let's call it a coupling, sigma replica, to present uh, the green link, right? So just need to be clear here, right? You, you have uh, the structure with the spin. So the spin is one type replica, but when you consider this green link, they become the second type, second species. That call it, okay, so the, the first species of replica and then the second species of replica is the green link. Um, and um, when we consider um, that the second kind of replica uh, species, we can compute the uh, partition function explicitly using this uh, subtle by approximation, and um, you can get uh, some set of cell consistency equation, and then you can solve it. When you solve it, you will have some feeling of the structure. Um, like for those who know a bit more technical details, you can go 
even beyond the replica symmetry solution, you go to the one-step replica symmetry breaking. Basically, everything is just uh, following some standard recipe. Once you know that, you just apply that. So there is no magic here. Um, but this is all about physics. We want to talk about the last part, the biological part, right? So the physics is just to give you some framework to understand that uh, you want to formalize the coevolution of the genotype phenotype mapping, and you can achieve that by formulating a statistical physics problem with two different types of uh, replica species. And now, with that framework, you can analyze the model. And to answer again the question that I emphasized at the beginning, how the uh, like interrelationship between genotype and phenotype affects the robotness of the system. Yeah? Um, and just to make life simple, because maybe it will become too complicated, as you have seen a bit, this is a kind of very uh, big equation. In this part, we restrict ourselves to the replica symmetric solution and learn about the biological behavior from that solution. Of course, maybe if you do more in terms of the hierarchy of the replica, you can understand more. But um, we try to be modest, yeah? So does your replica symmetric ansatz give you a negative entropy? When no, you solve it? we will analyze that thing. So it will give the negative entropy if you cross the AT line. We analyze that. Uh, let's like, look at it in the two, like, few slides. Okay. We analyze okay. that. There okay. is some negative entropy as uh, standardly observed in, in the SK model. Um, so let's go first uh, to that. So, Thank you for your comments. So we basically, for the replica symmetric solution, we neglect the dependent on the indexes. So instead of this quantity depend on one index and that quantity depend on two index, what people call the overlap, right, the Q here, you can just now take it as uh, some number instead of a matrix. Yeah? So with that, you have uh, the first type of replica, right, the spin, which have a finite number because the number of replica here equal to the ratio between the two temperatures. So it's also, again, different from the quench limit when you need to take this n as an integer at the beginning and then take the limit and go to zero. Yeah? And the second type of replica, right, the coupling is one. Uh, it has similar structure, right? It's also, again, you need to consider the overlap. But now the overlap becomes the overlap between uh, two coupling constants, the average. Uh, let's call it the correlation between two uh, links. But here, that replica have an infinite number. So this is a picture of two different species of replica, one with finite number and another with infinite number. And then you can consider this other parameter, right, in the replica symmetry answer, which is one thing that I need to remark. So NT is the number of target spin, N is the number of total spin in the system, and P here, uh, is the ratio between the number of target to the total number of spin, and that one will be fixed. So the thermodynamic limit here is you make that one and that one both go to infinite, but the ratio is fixed. Um, okay, too much into detail, I'm afraid about that. Um, so now you will get some solution of, of this equation. You can do it in the computer, you make it an iterative solution, and then you can find, for instance, if you fix the fraction is 0 0.1, uh, you observe the following picture, right? The phase diagram um, for the M, for instance, right? So the local magnetization, and sometimes you can also call it uh, fitness because this is basically the average magnetization of the, of the spin in the target set. Yeah, so far so good. It's just a few pictures to show you. And this is different from the non-target because for the non-target, most of the time on the quantity are just zero, like 10 to the minus 11, for instance. And of course, you can have some uh, spin last phase with that non-zero value of Q. But just to say that for the non-target, they are not under any fitness effect. So the behavior of the non-target are dramatically different from the target one. So for the target one, you can have some phases in which the value of M is high, the value of Q is high, the correlation between the two links are high here, and the whole so Oh, I forgot that. That may be interesting for you relating to your morning question, what can be the structure of this uh, network? Actually, the, the link between two target spins, the JIJ here, so their mean value is phi. If you plot it as a function of TJ and TS, 
you will see that it's almost zero out there. It's positive here, but it's maximal in this intermediate value matching to the simulation result from Kuni, for instance. So this means that the system inside this uh, small cut uh, regions tend to become a federal magnet because the link become positive. Outside from that, it's type random system, as a much random as a spin blast system. Here it's also slightly positive, but here it is really the, the basis where we believe the system in the federal phase. And as you can uh, uh, suspect it, right? If you have all the couplings constant are uh, ferromagnetic, then you can have just a very simple kind of uh, easing system inside that way. So this means you can imagine that the target spin, um, so you can imagine that very simple structure. So the target spin are linked by the ferromagnetic interaction here, and it's some isolated uh, island, and it is surrounded by the non-target spin. And here the interaction can be plus minus randomly distributed. So this is some, some analogy here. And uh, OK, so this is the behavior of the target. And it's very different from the non-target. And now if we combine all this uh, sort of information, uh, we can plot this uh, phase diagram. Uh, before I go to your question, first let's focus on this uh, uh, phase diagram. So this phase diagram have five different uh, regions in total. Two of them are not, how to say, biologically interesting. Because in the first P1, uh, P1 here, it is actually the short name for uh, paramagnetic one. So in that paramagnetic phase, you have um, no fitness, because fitness is uh, equal to this uh, magnetization, right? It's zero. You have also uh, no overlap, and you also have no gene-gene correlation. So in this P1, regions, nothing interesting happened. In the, sorry? Uh, uh, in the SP1, uh, in the SP1, so the very small neighborhood here, right? Do you have uh, something maybe very interesting for spin last physicists, but not, again, not so interesting for biologists, for instance? Because in these uh, regions, do you have non-zero overlap between two spin replica? So is the guy of spin last phase? But again, here the magnetization is zero, so no fitness. So both of these, P1 and SP1, they are physically meaningful, interestingly, for some so spin glass physics, but for biophysics, for instance, which our fitness it may not be so important. Now we move to the next two phases, which is the SP2 and the P2. So the SP2, is now becoming interesting because for the first time you see uh, non-zero fitness. So the fitness, you know, magnetization here, right, is positive, indicating that the system is functional. It has some sort of fitness. And then it also has a little bit of overlap here. But still, the correlation between the two uh, genes are zero. So in these regions, the system is not robust because our, by our definition, the system can only robust if all of these three other parameters are non-zero. And actually, they need to have a high value. So non-zero is not sufficient. It needs to have quite sufficiently high value. Now we found that in that uh, R regions, what we call robust region here, you actually fulfill this requirement. You have all the other parameters uh, having the high value. And we call it functional and robust uh, uh, phase with respect to this phenotypic noise and the genotypic uh, noise too. And now to your questions. What happened in this border? Actually, if you cross this border, uh, you end up having the replica symmetry solution losses the stability. So actually, this kind of line is really the AT line in, this, in the context of this model. So replica symmetry breaking on this border between this SP2 and R. You can show that by the stability analysis. So negative entropy happens there. And of course, if you want to make the full comprehensive treatment of the model, you need to go the full replica here to analyze the transition between these two regions. But we are happy with the thing that we got. So 
biologically uh, meaningful here with the Rivka solution. And from that point onward, I only focus on this robot regions. I will just focus on this, uh, this uh, R phases and analyze the structure of that R phases. Because um, it's not my task to, to make full com uh, complex physics uh, treatment of the model. Just first to give you the feeling of the model, how the phases are located. And um, now we can move uh, on to the, okay. So one thing is that the y axis here go to one, which means that we consider uh, from very small selection, uh, very high selection pressure to have uh, small selection pressure. But now since we are only interested in these R regions, we will focus in the much lower uh, genotypic noise neighborhood. So I will cut the phase diagram until that point to analyze this in more detail, to take a closer look. Um, so let's take a close look. When we fix the TR, TJ up to 0, 0 0.1, now we can ask some more detailed questions. The first question is that all of the results I have showed you so far is for this P. So P, say again, is the ratio between target to the total number of spin. And there should be some P dependent of the model behavior, right? So the first question to be asked is how um, the value of P affects the selection pressure in such a way that the robot phase only emerge uh, below some TJ, for instance. And this is how you can see, uh, like I take here three representative value of P, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.7. Um, you see that for all of the value of P, of course you always observe this the robot regions, but uh, it seems that the higher you have the P, the lower TJ, so the higher beta J, so the inverse of TJ, right, the selection pressure you need to achieve this robot phase. So once you plot the inverse of the TJ as a function of the P, you see that it increase with the fraction P. Meaning that the, now we go back to the cartoon that I really love, the Pac-Man shape, right? So the Pac-Man means that the P represents the size, the relative size of the mouth of the Pac-Man, right? So the bigger the size of the Pac-Man, the higher selection pressure you need which means that the lower TJ that you need uh, for achieving the robust region. So this means maybe that this is why, as I saw in the beginning, the, uh, the optimal fraction that uh, you observe in, in the numer not numerical, in the empirical data set is P around 20 to 10 to 20 percentage. So we see that if P is more, you can use relatively low selection pressure. If the P is large, it requires much higher selection pressure. So at least maybe biologically relevant uh, answer. And uh, the second thing which we also observe when we analyze the model in more detail, we watch the, we call some kind of chain of relationship between the genotype and phenotype. This is quite interesting. So now you plot two things and you compare. So on the left hand side is the marketization. On the right hand side, this is the gene gene correlation Q. You see that if you increase the TS, you increase the Q. So the Q jump to close to one when you increase the TS. But as long as you increase the TS, you decrease the fitness, the M go down. So the behavior of these two quantities are different. One goes up, the other go down. And uh, it's quite interesting, right? And first of all, you can define two critical kind of temperature. One is the temperature at which the, uh, the correlation between the gene go to one, so we call it TC1 here. And the other critical temperature is TC2, which is the point at which the marketization here vanishes. So there's no fitness. And, uh, we still don't get the maybe full comprehensive answer for this kind of relationship, but there is some argument. Maybe the argument is quite heuristic, not uh, sufficiently complicated, but maybe it's uh, sufficiently uh, explainable in some sense. So if you consider the number of 
non-target spin. So n minus n t is the number of non-target spin. And the frustration index is something like 1 minus the correlation. Then you see, well, kind of, I can say it's a phase transition-like behavior. If you analyze also the scaling exponent, you can do whatever thing you want here. But the point is that um, you see a proportionality. Whenever this 1 over q goes up, then the number of non-target spin also goes up. And the number of non-target spin uh, represents the redundancy of the genotype. So this redundancy increases with the number of the non-target spin. And, um, and Q is a homogeneity between the, um, the gene, right? So 1 minus Q is a redundancy. And this means that if you want to increase the number of ways to change the fitness uh, with the number of non-target spin, then you will have higher redundancy. And at the end, this will decrease the fitness. So this is just an intuitive uh, explanation for, for why this kind of chain of relationship happens. And uh, um, OK, there is an, an, um, another point we also want to explain here is that so far, I just explained the dependence of the fitness and the Q as a function of the TS, so the phenotypic noise. Actually, you can also look at that as a function of the uh, genotypic noise. And you will see some kind of non monotonic behavior here. This is quite interesting. So when you have P equals 0 0.2, it's here, 0 0.3 here, 0 0.4 it is here, 0 0.5 it is here, but then, by, OK, no, sorry, 0 0.5 here, 0 0.6 is here, and then 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. So actually, if you plot it, so the temperature at which the M becomes non-zero, it's behave like that. So it suggests that the relationship between the fitness and the function of the genotypic noise is non-monotonic with regard to P. So it, just to, to show that it's not trivial in this system that you expect the dependent on P is some monotonic function. It is not the case here. And um, I think this is the uh, final um, point from our approach, which re uh, related to the morning lecture by Kuni. So um, in the morning lecture, um, Kuni emphasized the relationship between robustness to noise and robustness to mutation. So within this context, uh, mutation means a change in the network structure. So if you consider uh, a change in the genotype, so some small infinitesimal chain of the genotype, um, you can consider what would be called mutational susceptibility. So you take this infinite, uh, infinitesimal chain of the genotype, and you consider the corresponding chain in the fitness. You take the derivative, right? Basically, you get this quantity. And on the other hand, you have the more standard susceptibility by perturbation uh, of some kind of external field. And then you can show that the two types of susceptibility are proportional. So it is a, maybe it's not as a general as a what could be obtained in some dynamical system context. But it's just to show you that at least within this approach, you can observe the same phenomenon of proportionality between the susceptibility to the environmental effect and the susceptibility to the mutational effect. And uh, by the way, just to comment that this kind of uh, relationship between two different types of susceptibility also have been obtained and analyzed in uh, Kuni uh, as a model, like in the context of gene regulatory or uh, some more recent paper. I, I just mentioned it here. Um, OK, so I think I come to the end of my uh, presentation. You can scan the, uh, uh, this QR code for the paper. So just to wrap up the thing, we want to understand how the interrelationship, the coevolution of the genotype and phenotype affect its robustness, right? And we observe that it can give rise to a robust system, robust biological system, but only within an intermediate range of the phenotypic noise. So which means that too low noise is not good, too high noise is also not good, only in some intermediate value of noise it's good. So it's quite similar to the model, to the conclusion from the model in the morning lecture of Kuni, even though these two models are in quite different contexts. So just to say something spec uh, uh, like 
speculative in the future work. So this is model that we use is the SSK model is some model with some Hamiltonian dynamics. We think that this uh, uh, is possible to extend the idea, not the technique, because the technique you need to like come up with uh, some more technical detail. But the idea of uh, considering two different types of, of uh, degree of freedom, and then consider how phenotypes are represented by one type degree of freedom, and phenotypes are represented by another type degree of freedom, and then how these two different type degree of freedom affect each other is something we want to extend it. And actually, this kind of system with coevolution are quite popular nowadays. So it can be observed in social system with uh, involving relationship between people. Again, from the original paper that I cited, you see it have been applied in the context of neural network with learning. It can also go to the ecosystem with uh, uh, involving interspecies interaction. So one example is that the paper. And so finally, it can uh, be applied and extended to the gene expression dynamic. And actually, I am working on that uh, extension now. So just to give you some pictures of this Kuni model you saw in the morning, right? This model can be phrased in terms of the set of two different types of uh, ODE system with the stochasticity for the gene expression and the stochasticity for the updating of the gene. And then you have two different time scale, and we are developing some uh, theory for this system too. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for questions. Uh, in the model, you, you did not use the like the fact that also the environment can be changing and can be like noisy. No, no, the noise is um, the, the phenotypic temperature. The yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, and the environment actually in that last slide, you see, in order to consider how the system respond to perturbation, we consider that quantity. We did calculate it at the end. Just in the formulation to skip many details, I did not show that. But we, we use that at some point. No, but uh, when you define the fitness, you just uh, use a target, uh, yeah, a fixed target. Yeah, you use the target spin. Yeah, but you can use also for the environment, uh, for example, a Hamiltonian, uh, a Hamiltonian. And in this way, you can get uh, different results, I think. For example, uh, a field instead of the, just the target set and the non-target set. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this could lead to different results? I think it can enrich the model behavior. Because for instance, actually, Kuni is working on some model with three different groups of spin now. And then the model behavior become richer. So one, so let's think about it as a layer. You have one layer is a target, another is a non-target. You can put some like intermediate layer, for instance. Or you can put some group of spin as a sensory spin. So these are spin which are directly in contact with the environment. So if you alter the, the state of this sensory spin, you affect the rest of the system, for instance. So yeah, this, uh, thank you for the question. some external field in this model, and this external field changes in time or something, environmental change. So that's, uh, maybe he can do that, but yeah. it's not, uh, yeah. And for the gene regulation network model, I did a little bit, and in that case, so, so variance somehow remains, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I have I had a very similar question, so, um, in, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I have a question. So, yeah, 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 thank you. No, no, yeah, I mean, in, uh, in the sense that, uh, I mean, in general here you, you have like a map between genotypes, so DJ and uh, fitness, which is uh, stochastic, right? Mm -hmm. And you have, uh, I mean, in principle, two very different sources of stochasticity. One is the fact that the environment is fluctuating, so the target function is changing. 
-hmm. And one is the fact that your mapping between uh, uh, genotype and uh, phenotype and therefore fitness is stochastic by itself. Mm -hmm. So I think I, mean, I have a different uh, perhaps flavor of the question is, can you distinguish between the two or you expect that uh, also in the other case, namely that uh, you have uh, an environment which is fluctuating, this uh, relation between robustness and stochasticity still hold? I think it's the matter of belief. So I believe that they are correlated. Yeah, but <clears throat> maybe that does not sound like a good answer. But the point is that when you formulate that map, everything is entangled. So in the biological like review paper, they always try to to make things like uh, convoluted so that you never see the effect of the two maps. So basically, the way we, we work it out here is like approximation. Let's put it that way. So you have one stochastic city here and another stochastic city here. But in most of the uh, preview paper I read, they consider only one so stochastic city, but for both of the processes. So it somehow convoluted and uh, it's not clear how to deal with that type of system. So this is why we formulate it in such a way. So just to say that it's uh, just an approximation. We, we don't have the full answer to your question. This is a limitation of the approach understand is if they are equivalent or not they may not be equivalent because uh, how to say because actually um, I also skip some of the detail so in order to get to that for instance um, uh, some kind of calculation here right uh, you need to take some uh, assumption you need to, you need to respect this time scale separation assumption so that um, the idea is that the stochasticity play on one scale does not affect the stochastic, stochasticity play on another scale. But if you combine the two, then maybe it's different because now everything are too, uh, how to say, interrelated. Yeah, I, I'm sorry if I don't have the good answer. Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Oh.